Okay, so we're, I'm going to introduce Jamie Stevens. Is she in here? <laughs> you are. Good girl. Okay, okay. Okay, she's the co-founder of the local water group, Safer Water North Texas. Yay! <laughs> Woo! They have merchandise back there, and it's really important that I say it slow because it is Safer Water North Texas. There's a story about this. I'm not sure if Jamie's going to touch on it. Touch on it, yeah. Okay, so this Safer Water North Texas grew quickly to over 13,000 members. And she said quickly on here, but literally three weeks. And that's just amazing. Okay, the group's efforts brought famed environmental activist Aaron Brockovich to Dallas to speak on the specific water quality issue in North Texas and help advise the group on how to create lasting change. She came April 5th of this year. Along with the other group founders, Jamie has spearheaded independent lab testing, environmental attorneys, and water quality experts to form a team that is committed to fighting for safer water for generations to come. Jamie lives in Frisco with her husband and three and a half year old, really cute little boy. Please join me in welcoming Janie, Jamie Stevens. Okay, so this should be really interesting because my speech was not printed and I've read it once. So y'all bear with me because I kind of know what I'm talking about. I know all this stuff, so I'll just be able to kind of hopefully just do whatever. Um, so thank you everyone for coming out. I'm so excited to be here. So honored that Regina asked um, our groups to be in presence tonight and be able to speak to you about Safer Water. Um, as she said, my name is Jamie Stevens. I'm one of the co-founders of the Safer Water of North Texas group. Um, so I'm a pediatric neuropsychologist by trade. My husband's a chiropractor. Um, I live in Frisco with my husband and um, my three and a half year old son who is adorable but also a hot mess. He's hyper all over the place, jumping off things. I'm waiting to go to the ER with broken bones. Um, so the reason that I'm so passionate about this is that my husband and I are extremely holistic. We um, are very careful about every single thing that goes into um, our son's body or is on his body, um, and we always have been. And so um, when I realized what was happening with the water, it was very concerning to me because the water is really the foundation of life and of what we really need to be able to thrive and live. So it was extremely concerning to me. Um, so a little backstory about how our group was formed. In early March, um, people from all over this area started to notice something different in their water. Now everyone who's lived here for a while knows that something in our water starts to smell kind of like chlorine at different times of the year. And we also know that once a year it tastes really, really bad and that's kind of during that algae bloom time. So most of us are familiar with that, but this time there was something different. There was this massive outcry, um, and residents knew that it wasn't okay. People wanted to know why are their babies breaking out in hives after they take a bath. Um, people wanted answers as to why their hair was falling out. Um, people demanded to know why their pets were becoming deathly ill, and in some cases even dying. Um, they, did not own, they did the only thing that they knew to do, which was start contacting their city officials. Um, those city officials passed along the citizen emails to the North Texas Municipal Water District. Sadly, most of those concerns were completely swept under the rug um, in what I can only describe as the biggest <laughs> PR nightmare in history in terms of what we've seen. Um, so then what happened is that really... Um, people felt like they weren't getting answers. They felt like their concerns, which were valid, were being brushed under the rug. And so that's when people from all these towns in North Texas started talking on social media about their concerns. Um, they voiced their concerns over the water that seemed to be causing sickness and some pretty serious medical issues. Um, we're going to have some different medical professionals that are going to be able to talk more specifically about what that is. Um, it was also in that time that Plano grabbed the attention of the amazing woman, Erin Brockovich, who you've probably heard of. Um, people in North Texas area then were really, we were already questioning the water, but when Erin got involved and posted about the toxic water practices by the North Texas Municipal Water Supply, that was when um, really this group began to form because it really gave a platform for people to come together and to be able to say, wow, I have these concerns too. Um, so, as many of you know, we are the group that officially brought Aaron Brockovich to Texas, um, and I promise we're going to get to that in a minute. 
It was during this time in early March that myself um, and Leah Wilcox and Amanda Trask, we all got together and secured um, the Facebook domain and began the group. Um, at a breakfast meeting, we sat and talked and we really realized that this was so much bigger than we thought, but that we knew that we had to do something because if somebody doesn't step up to do it, it's not gonna get done. And a bunch of people just talking about it on social media that isn't gonna affect any sort of change. So somebody had to start organizing and getting things together. Um, our mission really started very simply. It was a way for concerned citizens to have a central location to share and compare their stories. But quickly it grew into an organization of advocacy and in no time we were attending city council meetings in Plano, Frisco, Allen, McKinney, Garland, and we were even attending board meetings at the North Texas Municipal Water District. We were even dealing with a media circus of our own. I think at this point I've officially been on TV way more than I ever wanted to be. Um, so at that point we started communicating um, with Erin Brockovich via her Facebook post and she said, um, you know, if you organize yourselves, I'll come to Texas. And I was like, yeah, right, she's not gonna come. She, there's no way. Uh, but she did and she was actually extremely helpful for us. So um, when Erin spoke, um, we got organized, and from that day in mid-March to um, the day that she came to visit on April 5th was nothing short of a whirlwind experience. Erin and her water expert, Bob, who's a national um, renowned water expert and a published author, helped to shine light on some very disturbing practices involving our water um, that's proclaimed as safe, as you know. That's what we keep hearing, is that the water meets all state and federal regulations. Um, and all of you guys must be crazy that you're experiencing these problems. Um, the things that Aaron and Bob really explained to us that evening in Frisco um, are things that really all personally never forget. We can no longer sit back and remain unconscious about the water practices in our area. We can no longer pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. We can no longer sit around and trust that these people have our best interests at heart because they just don't. The things that we've learned um, about this water district through meetings, through legally obtained documents, through emails, through lab reports, through our own independent lab testing, there are a lot of underhand shady stunts that have been pulled, like cyber squatting on our website domains. That's part of what Regina was um, referring to. That's why we are safe for water and they have a website out there that's safe water in North Texas. Um, and they bought up all the URLs around that so we can't have those. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that are concerning because the thing is is that if you have nothing to hide, there's absolutely no reason to hide behind client attorney privilege when we ask for lab reports. Um, there's, no, there's no reason to take up all the URLs. There's no reason to block us every single time that we're trying to obtain information that legally we have the right to obtain through the Freedom of Information Act. And sadly, our group has been blocked at every single juncture of this process, which is, I think, really um, frustrating for us because I think that this is what we all deserve is to have answers and to have the information and to be able to move forward however we think is best for the group. Um, so really, I think that this has been an amazing ride so far and I still can't believe the awesome power of the community that's come together for this cause. I still can't believe that we have 14,000 members and that we're growing every single day and that we have, I, I get emails and calls all day long of people who want to get involved and want to help and people who are experts in different areas and we're so, so thankful for that. We've really achieved some great things in this short time and there are so many more great things to come. I think this has really just begun. Um, so I want to thank you guys so much for taking the time just to kind of hear a little bit about our journey. Um, I know that, you know, it's hard to find time to come and get away from kids and other work responsibilities and things to be here. So I just really applaud all of you for really having a vast interest in the safety of our water overall and being really motivated to be here. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to the fabulous Regina. Thank you so much, guys. Hi there. So about the time that um, Regina and Jamie are referring to back in February, March time frame, there was a really um, interesting post put on Facebook and it garnered quite a bit of attention. And we have permission to use the verbiage from that post. Um, the author could not be with us tonight. 
I live in McKinney and have lost four of my beautiful horses to cancer since 2012. They drink up to 30 gallons of this pool smelling water every day. My dog currently has cancer too. There is no way I can boil or treat enough water for my animals. It tastes like crap too, as I have to drink and bathe in it. There has to be a better way. Rest in peace, buttermilk, trigger, smoke, and jewel. I hope something changes soon before any more animals or people get sick. So this post got a lot of attention, as I said, and um, when Regina saw it, she it w reminded her of something that she had witnessed, um, a video that she had seen, and we want to play a clip from the video. If you want to see the complete video, it is on YouTube. And this video may provide some possible answers. Take a look. Hi, I'm Kathy Justice. My husband is Wayne Justice, Western artist. We raise registered quarter horses. We breed, show, and play with our horses. We love our horses. And uh, everything was going great until 1985 when artificial fluoridation started. We had no idea that was what was making our horses sick. So we changed feeds. We did everything. Had vets come out. We went, went to the ends of the earth trying to figure out what was wrong with our horses. And it wasn't until my most precious baby doe died. It's hard to talk about it. Anyway, we sent, we sent her leg. When she died, we had had we'd taken her to um, six different vets, two of which were at uh, Colorado State University that had absolutely no clue what was wrong with her. And we, after she died, we asked the vet to do an autopsy, and the vet thought that possibly there were other things that had killed her. She had so many varied symptoms, neurological problems, uh, Cushing's disease, uh, lameness, thyroid problems, breathing problems, the list just goes on and on, reproductive problems. And so the vet said that she thought that possibly some of the symptoms could have been pointed to particular things, West Nile, botulism, EPM, different things. And so we told the vet to test her for anything and everything that, that, we could, that she could think of that could have caused her problems, because we wanted a, a definitive answer as to what killed her. But I specifically told her I wanted her checked for chronic fluoride poisoning, which at that time was still my theory that that was what was bothering her, was making her sick. Anyway, the, the vet took heart, lung, liver, kidney, all kinds of, of uh, parts and sent them off, and every one of them came ne back negative. We went ahead and buried the mare without a definitive answer of what killed her. So I got on the phone, was able to contact Dr. Leonard Crook, um, professor of, of pathology emeritus at Cornell University, who has spent his life uh, diagnosing chronic fluoride poisoning, mostly in cattle, and told him what, what the symptoms were. And he said, well, I need a leg. He wanted to know if the vet had taken any bone specimens, and I said no, and he said, well, that's the only way that we can make a positive diagnosis. So my husband dug the mare back up, took a leg just below the knee, and sent it to Dr. Krug. Started by examining one uh, selected bone submitted for examination. We did chemical analysis of the bone ash. We took radiographs and we took uh, samples for microscopic uh, examination. The changes in the radiographs and those under the microscopes are typical, not to say pathognomonic, of fluoride poisoning. So in the first report on that single case only, I concluded, quote, with reasonable scientific probability, unquote, that 
these changes here indicate that the horse was suffering from chronic fluoride poisoning. And after about a month, we received a 17-page report with the final conclusion of chronic fluoride poisoning. A friend of ours uh, who had a horse, a gelding, that had had similar symptoms, obviously not the reproductive problems, but the Cushing's disease, the um, breathing problems, skin problems, different things. And uh, that horse got so bad that they put him down. And uh, so they, we took a leg, one of his legs, and said to, to Cornell, and his report also came back with chronic fluoride poisoning. There was a third horse, also not my horse, uh, that had died. The owner said that the horse had had chronic back problems ever since they had moved to Pagosa Springs and had no clue why it had had back problems. And so we took its leg when it was put down and sent, and it also came back with the same diagnosis. In uh, 2000. Five, we had uh, another, yet another mare. When she finally died, we sent her bone, and it came back with the same conclusion. My horse that I call Skipper, uh, right from the get-go when he was born, and he's second generation, uh, started out with an attitude, and uh, he'd try to bite me any time I went by, and he even kicked me one time, and and to the point where at one time I even thought of getting rid of him and getting another horse. Uh, this was all while he was on fluoridated water. We noticed it didn't take too long after fluoridation had quit in our water that his attitude changed and he, uh, he now is a, a lover. I, he's a completely different horse. So I wouldn't sell him or part with him for a million dollars. No, he's a great horse. Uh, this also happened with one other horse that we have that has a completely different breeding. So we know it, it's not the breeding that's caused it. And uh, she used to would bite you any time you'd walk by her stall. And now she's the same way. She's a a lover and I've been around horses all my life and and uh, so I, I know it wasn't from the way I was treating him or or trying to deal with him the reason that he had that attitude it had to have been the fluoridation winter of 2003-2004 uh, we had snow on the ground all winter long that's the first winter in many winters because Colorado's been having a drought that we had snow on the ground all winter long. We have a 100-gallon tank outside, and we do allow our horses to be horses, so we keep them in the barn at night, but during the day, which is the biggest part of their day, they are out and they're able to play and do what they like to do. Well, we noticed that that tank that we normally filled every day to day and a half was only needing filled every 18 to 19 days. So we started watching the horses, and they would even stand right there by the tank uh, with the heated city fluoridated water, looked clean, and eat snow. And they were eating snow a big part of the day. And uh, we noticed that they all the colic stopped. The amount of colics that we were having, we didn't have one colic all winter long. And almost all of the symptoms, we had uh, Baby Doe who had all this heavy Cushing's hair, she shed all winter long. Well, when it gets down to 35 degrees below zero, a horse shouldn't be shedding, but she was shedding this excess hair. Um, anyway, after all this snow melted, we have a little ravine that runs through our place, and there was still snow up on the hill under the trees. And uh, this little, you can't even call it a stream, is about six inches wide and maybe an inch deep of water, muddy water was coming down the hill. And the horses would go over there and dig a little pool of this dirty, thick, muddy water and would rather drink that water rather than drink the so-called clean city water. Um, so uh, after that all dried up, we got our first colic again when they had to start drinking only city water. So uh, we did a major search again. We'd been searching for years, finally found someone 
who would allow us to use their water rights out of the San Juan River to haul water. And uh, we bought a, a big 325 or 50 gallon tank that we put in the back of our truck and started hauling water for our horses. Since then, that was in March of 2004, we have not had another colic. And every symptom has abated since then other than Baby Doe and the other mare bird that died that were just too far gone. They were so far gone, uh, had, had too much accumulation in their body to uh, come out of it. Horses, on average, a standing horse, one that is not doing anything, will drink between 10 to 12 gallons a day. A lactating mare can actually double that amount. Uh, ironic thing is the horses that we had get the sickest, the quickest, were the mares that were lactating, the mares that we, we had for brood mares. And you see here, this is Baby Doe, the first horse that Dr. Crook diagnosed. Her hooves were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the, this was the spring of 2004 after having snow on the ground, and you can see her hoof was growing back to normal. This was the abnormal part. And I was making a list of things that were manifesting in our horses, uh, so I'm going to read it here. Um, of course, the colics, head shaking, muscle twitching, spasms, seizures, falling for no reason, jerking, eventually complete loss of neurological response, skeletal problems, bony deposits on bones, cracking and popping with every move, hoof deformities, lameness, legs on lo grown horses becoming bowed and, bowed and crooked, swelling joints, tendons and ligaments hardening, laminitis, and he brought up the point that there are so many animals, horses these days, being afflicted with laminitis for not any real apparent reason that fluoride might be a problem with this epidemic. Choppy stiff gaits, joints giving way, ribs becoming fused so breathing was difficult, thinness, abscesses, slobbering, thyroid problems, reproductive problems, excessive sweating, abortions, sterility, cryptorchids, constant milk production, even in mares that were not had never been bred, uterine discharges and infections. We had one mare that went from a regular infection to E. coli to staph infection that could not be controlled, lack of heat cycles, small and dismature foals, foals with, born with crooked legs, Cushing's disease and equine me metabolic syndrome. I had one lady call me from town that said she personally, without looking, had knew of 15 horses that had uh, Cushing's disease. Not shedding coats with very long coats, uh, horses that were very lethargic, loss of muscle tone and mass, dips over eyes w would fill in and stick out a lot of times beyond the eyeballs, lameness, and uh, dental chlorosis, and then the attitude problems that Wayne was talking about. Chronic coughing and wheezing, allergic reaction with skin bumps, kidney problems, constant excessive urination, and cancer. To summarize what we found in the justice horses, one, there is a source of fluoride, namely the artificial fluoridation of the community water, which is the only source of water for the horses and the only source of fluoride because there is no fluoridated mineral supplements used and there is no fluoride uh, containing fertilizer used on the farm. Two, dental fluorosis. Three, we have the clinical manifestations as documented by Kathy Justice there in numerous pictures, hoof deformities, thickened bones. Then we have chemical analysis of the bone ash from a number of horses. We have radiographic evidences. Now we are up to three, four, five. We have also microscopic evidences of fluoride damage to the bone tissue, also reported allergy reaction to the artificial fluoridation of the community water. So all with the evidences we have accumulated, there can be no doubt at all, and stated with reasonable scientific certainty, that the justice horses were and are suffering from chronic fluoride poisoning. He took uh, what he received, the information that he received from Baby Doe, my mare, 
Riley, the friend's horse, and the third horse, and wrote a peer-reviewed article that has now been published in the January-March issue, 2006 issue, of Fluoride, the quarterly journal of the International Society for Fluoride Research. Um, after that was written and published, there was so much worldwide response from that and request for a follow-up for more uh, symptoms that my horses showed that a second article has, and has now been written and peer-reviewed and published in the uh, April-June issue, 2006 issue of the same um, uh, periodical called Fluoride. It wasn't until we got the scientific paper from Dr. Crook, the first one from Baby Doe, that I sent the water department uh, uh, a letter and uh, told them, this is what you've done to my horses. And they were totally appalled. They, I mean, I've been the crazy blonde woman for years. And so they asked me to come and speak to one of their board meetings and actually asked, let me speak for over an hour. And being that they had never even called me to ask to say, you know, well, gee, what's going on out there? Why do you suspect the fluoridated water? They got an earful when they heard the stories, the horror stories, when they saw the pictures that we had of our horses through the years that they had totally ignored. After that first meeting, we had, I believe, another couple meetings, meeting or two with the board. Uh, second meeting, they were going to educate us how good fluoride was for us. And of course, the things that they said were basically lies. They were had, had believed the things that they had been told by the so-called experts, and they decided that they were going to have a countywide forum to uh, figure out what the general populace thought. Well, uh, a lot of people in Pagosa Springs had educated themselves we overfilled the room. There wasn't even standing room. I mean, it was, they were out in the halls wanting to get into this. Um, they had their so-called three experts, the uh, state epidemiologist and head of the public health department, and their state, uh, the state uh, fluoride expert and a local dentist. And the, I was warned five different times before, the week before the forum, that there will be no debating absolutely no debating, and I had read for years that the so-called experts will not debate because they cannot debate. What they are saying is not true. Um, anyway, we got there and we presented our side. They presented their side first. We presented our side. We also showed a tape of Dr. Hersey morning, doing his Chairman Senate uh, and subcommittee and testimony. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to present the views of the union on the issue of fluoridation of public water supplies. Our union represents the staff, scientists, lawyers, and others who analyze hazard exposure and economic data and advise management how to use them in public health protection. I'm not here today to speak for EPA, but rather the union, founded 17 years ago to protect EPA workers from unethical pressure by EPA managers. It was on that basis in 1985 that we first got involved in this issue. In 1997, we voted to oppose fluoridation, and our opposition has grown stronger as more adverse data on the practice has come in. In the interest of time, let me state our recommendations first. We ask that you order an independent review of the cancer bioassay of sodium fluoride mandated in 1977 by Congress. Evidence for carcinogenicity in that assay was systematically downgraded by a special executive branch commission appointed and run by the very agencies that Congress did not trust to run the uh, bioassay in the first place. That action saved fluoridation temporarily. We ask that you order chronic toxicity studies on the two waste products that are now used in 90% of fluoridation programs. EPA says there are at the present no chronic toxicity data on them, and we ask that you order EPA set an MCL for fluoride that's truly protective of all American citizens, infants and adults alike, because the current one does not, in violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. We ask that you order epidemiology studies using dental fluorosis as an index of exposure to determine the extent of other toxic effects, especially effects on the brain and bone in the population that are attributable to fluoride. We ask that you convene a, a joint congressional committee to give this issue the full airing that it deserves. It's been 23 years since the last one, and it's high time for a new one. I offer the following in support of these recommendations. The American people, and especially our children, are getting way too much fluoride. Two-thirds of children living in fluoridated communities have dental fluorosis in at least one tooth. 
Dental fluorosis is the visible manifestation of toxic overexposure to fluoride during their developmental years. The initial findings of the cancer bioassay were for clear evidence of carcinogenicity, and that is consistent with several epidemiology and many mutagenesis studies. The protective pollutant status that fluoride enjoys within EPA and other federal establishments is remarkable, as the charts over here show. EPA stated regarding the chemical used in 90% of fluoridated communities that, quote, by recovering fluosilicic acid from fertilizer manufacturing, water uh, and air pollution are minimized, and water authorities have a low cost of fluoride. In other words, EPA's solution to pollution by this waste product is dilution, as long as it's not dumped into rivers and lakes, but rather directly into drinking water systems. Congressman Calvert of the House Science Committee has letters of inquiry out to EPA and other federal entities on this subject. The 1983 report of a Surgeon General's panel on fluoride to EPA was altered without consultation or notification of the panel members so as to help EPA justify an outrageous set of drinking water standards promulgated in 1986. The results of a 50-year experiment conducted in Kingston and Newburgh, New York show that there's no overall difference in dental caries rates between the two communities, but there's a significantly higher incidence of dental fluorosis in the fluoridated community. Since 1994, there have been six studies that show adverse effects of fluoride on the brain, even at the so-called optimum level of one part per million. The epidemiology studies that we recommend above should make a prime effort to look at brain effects, given the national concern over attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and autism in our children. Three trial judges since 1978 made findings of fact that water fluoridation poses an unreasonable risk to the American people. Fluoridation proponents like to say that there's no real controversy about fluoridation, and they're right. When these three disinterested trial judges heard weeks of testimony, they came to the same conclusion that our union did about the unreasonable risks involved. The findings of fact remain untouched in those uh, uh, trials today. Recent publications indicate a link between the use of silico fluorides for fluoridation and elevated blood lead levels in children and antisocial behavior. And leading <clears throat> dental researchers are changing their views on the safety and efficacy of fluoridation. Doctors John Calhoun and Hardy Lineback, both former spokespersons for fluoridation, have published recantations of their former position. On behalf of EPA's professional community, I urge the subcommittee to convene a select committee for a national review of water fluoridation. It's high time we do that, and I'd be happy to take questions. And uh, the moans and groans while we were showing that tape was, was really great. Anyway, um, the audience pretty much chewed up the so-called experts. They put them in their place, and it was, uh, that was, I believe, March 8th of 2005, March 30th of 2005, all the equipment that was disconnected. We have no more fluoridation in Pagosa. So it can be done. I mean, we can, uh, but it takes being organized and showing the, the facts to the people that are, and now in Dallas, um, they can stop fluoridation tomorrow. Uh, there's 15 council members, and nine of them can vote to stop fluoridation. And you'd think with all this, this is 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, there have been more studies, and it's more conclusive. And in 1999, the actual proponents of fluoride um, had, did the study and said that it's topical use of fluoride if there's any benefit from it at all. So why are we ingesting it? It's, it's just a practice that's gone on for years, and it's like status quo. And trying to get them to change is difficult, but it's not impossible. So I would like to introduce our, our guest speaker here. His name is uh, Dr. Neil Carmen. He has a BS and an MS in biology from the University of Iowa and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in the biological sciences emphasizing natural products chemistry. He, um, after a I didn't touch any. Oh, it's back. Cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. After a PhD at uh, UT Austin, he taught environmental biology, pre-med bio biochemistry, and other bio biological, biolog I'm not a good, you know, bio courses. Anyways, hi, Armand. <laughs> okay. 
He has worked at environmental pollution issues in Texas for 38 years, including 12 years with the state environmental agency seeing extensive pollution from toxic chemicals and 26 years with the Sierra Club dealing with toxic chemicals and pollution. Neil became a whistleblower in 1989 over a toxic chemical cover-up of violations by the state environmental agency, and the agency end up s ended up suing a large chemical company over the violations. He has observed firsthand for nearly four decades how children and adults are harmed by environmental pollution exposures in dozens of communities and has dedicated his life to pursuing better public policies that decrease the damage to the human and the, env and the environment. Dr. Carmen has interacted with communities across the U.S. and Canada faced with challenges posed by environmental pollution. I'd like you to welcome Dr. Neil Carmen, who came up from Austin to give us some of the wealth of his knowledge, and um, welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, my first wake-up call on water pollution was in 1967. I was working temporarily at the University of Michigan's Great Lakes Research Center at Ann Arbor because the Great Lakes were badly polluted. The drinking water was greatly at risk uh, from you know, uh, public sources, also from industrial pollution. And it was a wake-up call because we were looking in microscopes and analyzers, what's wrong with the Great Lakes? They're dead. When you would see the freshwater uh, organisms uh, where it was unpolluted flowing into the polluted area, they would all die. And so we were looking at, well, uh, what's left? Uh, what could be the chemistry? It was shocking to me because I hadn't heard anything about this kind of a, a huge problem. And I said to myself at the time, if it can happen to the Great Lakes, it can happen to the planet. So we had been dealing with a massive uh, amount of chemical pollution, and that's why tonight I'm going to talk about stuck in the mud of the chemical deception. Um, We've, we're still, in a way, stuck back in the 1950s and the 60s, when at the time, the government was telling us that a little bit of radiation, a little bit of lead are okay for you. But very quickly, it came out, and I've met some of the scientists who were involved in uh, those studies, that there is no safe level of radiation and there's no safe level of lead. We're finding that to be true for mercury and probably for fluoride and many chemicals. How do I get this thing to move? Um, I've turned it on. It is... Okay. So I believe that it's not just a national water crisis we're facing because of all the chemicals in it, uh, whether it's in the raw water or it's what they add and the chemical changes, but there's a national chemical crisis that goes beyond the water. Uh, it's, it, the chemicals are everywhere. And if you study organic chemistry, you go back over 100 years when people began to cook up in laboratories in Europe and North America new chemical concoctions that we've never had in our bodies before. Our children, our babies have never had these things in their bodies. So uh, we are facing a national chemical crisis, toxic chemicals. Um, so one of the chemical deceptions that's gone on for over 50 years is that um, they say maybe at a high dose, like radiation or lead mercury, it's very toxic. But maybe at a low level, it's good for you. Um, this is one of the myths and the chemical deceptions that was dispelled a long time ago. And like I said, I met some of the scientists who interacted with President John Kennedy in 1962 over radiation from the bomb test. There had been 500 atmospheric bomb tests. And basically, what they told him, 
is that if you don't stop the atmospheric bomb tests, you will sterilize the future generations. There won't be any that will be able to reproduce. So in 1962 or three, there was the Atmospheric Nuclear Bomb Test Treaty, okay? So that was a big wake-up call. Um, and then, okay, so uh, in the 70s, I was learning about a lot of these problems because um, I was working in a laboratory and you know many of the chemicals I worked with uh, had these skull and crossbone warning labels on them so I knew I was dealing with some very nasty chemicals and then of course I had taken a lot of genetics including human genetics that some of these chemicals damage chromosomes in every cell in the body so I began to become very alarmed and then in 1975 after I had my PhD uh, I was teaching environmental biology and talking about what goes into the water because you have to realize pollution is not just local. We knew by the 60s and the 70s it's global. You can release mercury or PCBs or DDT here. It will move globally, although maybe the highest concentrations will be locally. Um, so uh, the big concern, of course, is babies because they're developing, uh, their genetics, their cell structure, their organs are so small and delicate. You don't want any chemical assaults. This is what the research has been showing for decades, uh, but we have not heeded that. We have not done enough to protect our children from chemical toxins. Um, there's actually over a hundred thousand chemicals in synthetic production today. Most of them have not been tested at all, except maybe on a few animals. But uh, we're really facing a, a terrible situation due to this lack of testing and regulation. Uh, this should have been another wake-up call, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. It came out in 1962. It was about the chemicals that are disrupting the ecosystems, the fish, the polar bears, uh, wildlife, and getting into our bodies through food, through water, whatever. Uh, but, um, and she actually was a scientist who'd worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and she was noticing effects in the environment that she began to report in the 1940s and the 1950s. These were over some of the pesticides like DDT because these things are very toxic, they're very persistent, which means they can last for decades in the environment and they're highly uh, bioaccumulative in the food chain. Um, so uh, the problem is she accused the chemical industry of uh, spreading false information about the safety of the chemicals when she knew that that was not the case. Um, and uh, a lot of these were chlorinated chemicals, okay? We get into this whole issue of chlorine chemistry. Um, so this was a bestseller at the time, but we are still dealing with the chemical deceptions of the 50s and the 60s that a little bit of these toxins are okay, they'll break down in the body, they don't, they bioaccumulate is a big concern, uh, and they can do damage over your, your lifetime. Okay, so um, one of the big problems are these untested chemicals, and I put them in red because a lot of them are halogenated chemicals, okay? Halogen refers to a group of elements in the periodic table, chlorine, bromine, fluorine. Iodine is not, it's a, it's a halogen, but it's not like the chlorine, bromine, and fluorine chemicals. Um, so uh, one of the best known chlorinated chemicals was Agent Orange that, that contaminated over 50,000 U.S. veterans in Vietnam because the, the, uh, the Agent Orange and herbicide was made with two herbicides, one that was badly contaminated with dioxin, a chlorine-containing chemical that there is no safe level of it. Um, 
So that was one of the wake-up calls, but the problem is that a lot of these chemicals have not been adequately studied. Um, so I want you to, you know, realize that if you ever see the word CL, which means chlorine, or BR, which means bromine, or F for fluorine, you need to be very concerned that it could be a highly toxic substance. But there's thousands of these things, okay? So it wasn't just Agent Orange that had this because it, these were two chlorinated herbicides, a 2,4-D and 2,4-5-trichlorophenoxyacetic acid. That was the chemical that was badly contaminated with dioxin because dioxin was just a derivative of it. Um, also, PCBs were being used for 50 years in electrical transformers. That's a chlorinated uh, benzene compound. They're now worldwide. They were banned in 1980. They were made for 50 years, uh, but they're everywhere. Um, and, and many, many other chemicals. There's also the fluorinated chemicals, the synthetics, uh, that are a big problem. Teflon is one of them, okay? I stopped using Teflon and, uh, 40 years ago because of my concerns about it. So the problem with these halogenated chemicals, whether they have chlorine, bromine, or fluorine, many of them are carcinogens. Many of them cause birth defects. They cause developmental effects. They, they change the DNA. Uh, they may uh, lower the IQ. They may cause sterility. And if it's not if it's not sterility in you, it might be your children or your grandchildren, okay? Um, there's neurological problems, okay? So anyway, um, one of my wake-up calls was in 1975, where at the end of this environmental course I was teaching, I had a student come back to me at the end of the semester, and he came to my office. I'll never forget it. He said, my father has just spent a year studying tap water in the United States. At Christmas, my father gave filters to everybody in the family, to all of his friends. He was an organic chemist hired by EPA to study the chemical contamination of the tap water in the US. He said, don't drink it. It's all contaminated with chemicals. And the student asked me, what do you think about that, Dr. Carmen? I said, I'm not surprised. I said, I haven't done any surveys around the country, but I know the chemicals are just, they're out there, they're everywhere, okay? Um, so that was a time when I wanted to, you know, drink filtered water, but it took me a while yet. It was in the 1980s that I stopped drinking tap water in the United States. So one of the, one of the concerns with um, these chemicals is that a lot of them are, oops, I want to go back a slide. Um, Okay, a lot of them are endocrine disruptors, and that's going to be a term I want to talk a little bit about, um, because endocrine disruptors refer to chemicals that can disrupt the seven hormonal producing glands in the body, from the brain, uh, the pituitary, the hypothalamus, the, uh, the thyroid, the adrenals, uh, and so forth. Uh, because they produce very small amounts of hormones. Well, these, a lot of these synthetic chemicals, these fluorinated, chlorinated, brominated chemicals, interfere with those glands. That's really bad if, if it's an infant or an unborn fetus, or even if it's an adult, uh, a woman who wants to get pregnant. Uh, you don't want uh, chemicals that disrupt the hormonal chemistry of your body. You don't want it in the diet. You don't want it in uh, the water. Um, so um, toxins that get into the baby are a huge concern. And back in the 50s and the 60s, they said, well, they won't cross the placenta from the mother if she eats them or drinks them or whatever. Well, that's not true. We have found out that the placenta will download the toxins right into the developing fetus. Uh, that's really a disaster, okay? Um, so basically, whatever the mother eats, whatever she drinks, it's going right into the fetus. And how do we know that? Well, 
Um, okay, this book was another wake-up call. 1996, I met the scientists. This was a follow-up to Silent Spring. They found out that there were these endocrine disrupting chemicals appearing in the wildlife. Rachel Carson talked about the cancers and the sterility, but she didn't know about the hormonal disruptions of the chemicals. Uh, like DDT and so forth in the wildlife. So uh, John Peterson Myers, Diane Dumanoski, and Theo Coborn authored this landmark book, Another Wake Up Call about the chemical deception, that it's a mess out there in the environment, okay, and in us humans. Um, anyway, so the endocrine disrupting issue uh, was such that in 96, the EPA set up a whole committee the Endocrine Disrupting um, uh, Testing and Advisory Committee uh, to start looking at the 100,000 plus chemicals. And I testified in Houston in, in, uh, uh, sometime that summer of 96, and industry didn't want to testify. But anyway, uh, they did later at some of the hearings. But today, we're still grinding through a few chemicals. So there's tens of thousands of chemicals that have not been tested for being hormonal disruptors. Uh, it's, it's, a big, it's a big mess. This is part of the chemical deception. Um, okay, the next slide. Okay, so, you know, one of the things I studied about was, uh, in human genetics, was shocking that many chemicals will damage the DNA, the chromosomes, and every cell in the body. So people wonder, how did I get cancer? When we're born, the doctors don't test our blood for carcinogen, so they, they probably should. And I can assure you today that we're mostly all loaded with toxic chemicals. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, I don't have a slide on it. They've been doing body burden surveys since 1994. They find hundreds of chemicals in us, and that's just where down to the detectability limits, if they went even further down to a one part per million, they would find thousands of chemicals in pretty much all of us, okay? Um, so this is one of the concerns why uh, we don't want these in our bodies because they do damage the DNA. Uh, okay, so, and how do we know they get into the babies? Because in 2004, there was an umbilical cord blood study by Environmental Working Group, and they found an average of 200 toxins per, per baby. Uh, I think it was a total of 287 different chemicals. These are the synthetics out there. It's not just the pesticides, but it's mercury and lead, and, and I don't even know if they looked for fluoride. Uh, but anyway, they published all this, and 180 of the toxins cause cancer uh, in humans or animals. Uh, 217 are toxic to the brain and the nervous system. 208 toxins cause birth defects or abnormalities in development in animal tests. Um, their conclusion, uh, the dangers of pre and postnatal exposure to this complex mixture of carcinogens, developmental toxins, and neurotoxins have never been studied. These are complex mixtures. Our toxicology is like a primitive science. Um, what is EPA doing? Well, they, like I said, they formed the, um, the, the committee in 1996, and they're slowly going through the chemicals. It'll take them a 1,000 years or more. Um, there's big concerns today about developmental neurotoxicity. And uh, I'm not going to go through this, but it's, it's a huge problem because we're seeing a lot of issues with children. And it's not surprising. They're loaded with chemicals and we don't know enough about it. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, okay, so these trihalomethanes, you know, should raise a red flag because they are halogenated. They contain fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and they shouldn't be in the water supply, is my opinion, until they have been tested to have no effect. I don't think that's going to be the case. So the water is not clean here in Texas or across the US. Uh, the only place I've been to where I think it's pretty good is Mount Shasta, California. It's groundwater. It's not 
um, or spring water, I should say. It's spring water. It's not chlorinated or anything. But there's very few places in the United States where the water, I think, is clean enough that I would drink it, okay? Um, so, um, oops, uh, go back one slide. Well, anyway, they, you know, for the trihalomethane standard, they use um, 80 parts per billion, averaged over a year. Well, I think that's a, a pretty weak standard. It's not, I want to, okay. So I think that standard probably should be less than a part per billion. So I don't think that's a safe drinking water standard. And maybe in 20 years, they'll get down to a part per billion or less, okay? It, none of it should be in the water, okay? Um, anyway, so these trihalomethanes are formed because the stuff that's in the raw water reacts with the chlorine. The chlorine's contaminated by bromine. I've been to Car Arkansas where the chlorine salts are mined. It's contaminated with bromine. So the chemical companies that sell the chlorine to all these cities around the US, they got bromine. So you get not just the chloroforms and those chlorinated uh, halomethanes, you get the bromines, and those are very, very toxic as well, carcinogens. Um, and then there's some other cancer risks, okay, uh, that they haven't, they don't, I don't know if they look for them all here, but there's some cancer-causing chemicals. They're halogenated compounds, 1,2-dichloroethane. Uh, it's got a very serious cancer risk. And also trichloroethylene. If you watch the movie, A Civil Action, this was actually the result of a best-selling book in the 1990s. It happened near uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and children were dying of cancer from solvents in the water, and they were chlorinated compounds, okay? So the um, uh, actor in the movie was John Travolta. What the movie doesn't tell you, it just says it was the water. It was the 10 minute hot shower, the solvents were evaporating, and, and the kids uh, were breathing in, getting inhalation exposure along with drinking it and so forth. Um, anyway, so um, there's also uh, halogenated compounds that are called acetic acids or haloacetic acids that have chlorine and bromine in them and they have cancer risks as well so it's more cancer risk besides just the uh, trihalomethanes um, this is something that environmental working group has on their website okay uh, they looked at the uh, hexavalent chromium levels at mesquite uh, this was based on the data that's been submitted and um, the level that was detected was 0.11 parts per million, uh, parts per billion. But the health guideline that they were putting up there is 0.02 parts per billion. In other words, the level was, was much higher than, uh, you know, the health guideline. Bromodichloromethane, okay, also much higher. Um, so anyway, this is on their website, and basically it suggests that if we really had truly protective standards for the stuff that's in the water, uh, they would have to have more filters uh, in there to get out a lot of these chemicals or prevent them from forming in the first place. And, and this is just some of the chemicals that they look at. Um, I know that there's actually analytical chemistry where they're looking at about 70 compounds. I wouldn't be surprised that you could find 10,000 in there if you went down to a part per trillion or even less than that. Uh, these are some more. Uh, chloroform, of course, uh, has a level that should be no more than one part per billion, has a, has a, a guideline, and uh, they detected 15.2. Uh, that's just, you know, one test. So even though it's legal, to have that level in the water. That's why I stopped drinking tap water over, over 30 years ago. Uh, I'm very concerned about. So um, to get out a lot of the chlorinated chemicals, they're bigger than the fluorine or the, the fluoride, so they're a little easier to take out. But, you know, then you have the issue of, of you know, do you, you want to bathe in it? Not really. 
uh, the chlorine and the chlorinated uh, compounds, the trihalomethanes, are an issue in a bath uh, because you're going to breathe it in. The fluoride is more of an ingestion issue from cooking and drinking with it. There's not that much in the water typically. So it's not a problem in, in the bath. But there are ways to filter these things out. But the cities should have better uh, treatment systems and uh, they shouldn't be allowing this in the water. Um, um, so now the fluoride. So this is what's in mother's milk, 0 0.004 parts per billion, or four parts per billion, okay? A very tiny amount. Uh, that is considered to be, uh, you know, what's in mother's milk, and it's, it's a safe level. Now, what does the EPA allow in the water? Well, it's 175 times more than that, okay? It's 0.7 ppm, or 700 parts per billion. Um, so that's 175 times higher than what mother's milk should have in it, okay? Uh, or any, uh, you know, anything we drink or eat. Now, what you don't know about is that fluoride was to connect it to the Manhattan Project in World War II. Anybody here the Manhattan Project? Do you know that fluoride was used in the manufacturing of the atomic bomb? So, um, how did that happen? Well, I'm going to touch on that at the end, okay? Uh, okay, so Bill Hersey, who is a scientist I've met, he's retired from EPA, he testified like, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago about the toxicity of fluoride compared to lead and arsenic. I mean, those lead and arsenic, you don't want any in your diet or in your body. Uh, and so fluoride is right in between in terms of toxicity. This came from a textbook that was written over 25 years ago by two uh, Dart Dartmouth University toxicologists. So, you know, it's a very, very toxic material. Now, in 2006, the National Resource Council um, did, had an expert panel of 12 scientists from across the U.S. And basically, they concluded um, their findings should have ended fluoridation right then. Um, what they found was that, um, okay, there's too much infants are getting overdosed with fluoride, too much. Okay, uh, damages the brain. It, fluoride is neurotoxic, okay? Um, it damages the bone. If you have dental fluorosis, you're gonna have bone damage. It's not just the, the teeth, okay? And there's a lot of evidence for that. And finally, it will mess up the thyroid because uh, the, the thyroid will not be allowed to take up, to incorporate iodine because the fluoride will disrupt that biochemical process through interfering with the enzymes. So, okay, so where does all this fluoride come from? Well, it's a waste product. It's, an, it's a toxic waste. One area is the phosphate fertilizer industry in Florida, Louisiana, other places. Um, and because they can't keep it in the fertilizer, if you leave fluoride in the fertilizer, it will kill any plant you put it on. It's very deadly to plants, okay? Uh, it, it, it disrupts enzyme systems at very low levels, so they put it in the water. Um, it's not a good idea. Uh, so some of it comes from the phosphate fertilizer industry, some comes from the chemical industry, some comes from the aluminum industry, and some from the nuclear industry, okay? Um, and, and this is a tanker truck. It's like a hazardous wa waste tanker truck that's coming in and it's offloading it. Uh, and I've been in a water treatment plant in Austin where, where they leaked it onto the, co onto the concrete and it left a hole because this stuff is so acidic, it eats glass, it eats concrete. And they're putting it in the water? I mean, I knew this in the 70s that this was one of the most acidic, corrosive materials you could possibly have, okay? Okay? Um, and so the EPA has classified fluoride as an endocrine disruptor, okay? In other words, it disrupts, for example, the thyroid, and probably all of the seven endocrine glands are messed up by fluoride alone, okay? Uh, the National Research uh, Institutes of Health Research shows that endocrine disruptors may pose the greatest risk during prenatal and early postnatal development. 
when organ and neural systems are forming. Fluoride risk, reduced thyroid function in pregnant women are, is linked to lower IQ in their children. So there's a, okay, so this is one of the chemicals. It's hexafluorosilicic acid. It's got six fluorine atoms with one silicon atom and two hydrogen atoms. Uh, it's called hexafluorosilicic acid. It's got a bunch of other names too. Um, it's, it's a toxic uh, industrial waste. Versus, now the natural fluoride in the water isn't that great either, calcium fluoride. But calcium is a natural buffer for the uh, toxic effects of fluoride in the body. But calcium fluoride can also be a problem around the world and here in Texas. Uh, but it's very different. So what's in this toxic uh, industrial fluoride waste? Well, there's arsenic. Arsenic is a cancer-causing chemical. That's a CCC. It causes neurotoxic effects. It causes birth defects. It's a mutagen. It causes reproductive effects. So all of these metals are in, are in this fluoride waste, okay? Arsenic, chromium, cadmium, lead, mercury, beryllium, barium, and, and several other metals. So it's loaded, and we think also that, that it's got some radionuclides. Now, why would that be in there? Because when they mine the phosphate, uh, or in Florida, Louisiana, there's norm materials, naturally occurring radioactive materials like uranium. You don't want uranium in your water, okay, or any radionuclides. Uh, this is a study from an Irish scientist, Declan Waugh, who sh looked at the cascading effects of this fluoride or hexafluorosilicic acid in the body and the biochemistry and the organ systems. It's, it's really uh, quite graphic that it has dramatic effects and at very low levels because fluorine is such an electronegative element that you don't want it in your system at all. Um, uh, in, in 2015, there was a, a landmark epidemiological study in Britain. They compared uh, hypothyroidism in a fluoridated part of London to a non-fluoridated area where they had the medical records. And what they found was, uh, well, they asked the question, are fluoride levels in drinking water associated with hypothyroidism prevalence in England? A large observational study um, and, and uh, it's quite dramatic what they found. Uh, basically, the, it was the first epidemiological, in other words, large populational study look at control group versus a fluoridated area. They found a link between hypothyroidism, in other words, the thyroid is not working properly. Um, and uh, we found that higher levels of fluoride in drinking water provide a useful contribution for predicting prevalence of hypothyroidism. It's, it's interfering with the thyroid. Um, and they said high hypothyroid prevalence uh, was uh, found to be at least 30% more likely in practices uh, located in areas with fluoride levels of, uh, above in excess of 0.3 milligrams per liter. This population study supports earlier hypotheses that fluoride is associated with hypothyroidism. It's an epidemic today, not just in England, but in the United States. Uh, we found that higher levels of fluoride in drinking water provide, okay, we already mentioned that one. Um, <coughs> so there was an, another uh, study, okay, Ashley uh, Mallon and Christine Till did a huge study across the United States looking at fluoride and ADH levels in children. And basically, uh, they found that exposure to fluoridated water and, a, and ADHD uh, is a growing concern in the United States. Um, and this was a study based on three different years of data. Um, and, okay, uh, let's go to the chart. It might be the next one. Um, okay, there's a graph. Okay, they looked at three years across the United States, 2003, 2007, and 2011. And so the bottom one is 2003, the middle one is 2007, 2011. These are different states and they, the amount, levels of fluoridation and the levels of ADHD. They found a high correlation between the amount of fluoridation 
in different states and the levels of ADHD. So uh, they're doing more studies. They said parents reported higher rates of medically diagnosed ADHD in their children in states in which a greater proportion of people receive fluoridated water from public water supplies. So uh, that was another major study that was done. Okay, uh, the weight of evidence for many animal and human studies is that fluoride is a potent neurotoxicant, okay? In other words, it interferes with brain chemistry. And um, 52 out of 59 studies have found an association um, between fairly modest exposure to fluoride and lower IQ in China, India, Mexico, Iran, and there's uh, work being done in the US. 19 of these studies, the fluoride concentration was less than four parts per million, which EPA says is the current safe drinking water standard. Um, over 100 animal studies have, been, have found fluoride damages the brain. Um, these are the findings, uh, damages the, to the hippocampus of the brain, uh, neuron uh, degeneration in the nervous system, uh, inhibition of a key enzyme called uh, cholinesterase. Uh, it's very important in nerve transmission. Uh, damage to the uh, nicotinic receptors and muscles. Um, decreased br brain glucose utilization. Glucose is a very important uh, nutrient in the brain and it increases oxidative stress, which is not good. Um, um, this is a Harvard meta-analysis of IQ studies. A, a group of Har researchers at Harvard um, looked at a group of these IQ studies. It's called a meta-analysis. And basically, they published this just a couple of years ago, um, uh, 2012. They looked at 27 studies comparing IQ in high versus low fluoride villages, okay? The study was published in a prestigious journal, Environmental Health Perspectives, okay? So it went through complete peer review. And what they found, uh, the results were remarkably consistent. In 26 of 27 studies, there was a lower average IQ, brain damage, in the high versus low fluoride villages, okay? Uh, average IQ lowering was about seven IQ points. And dramatic, okay? So, uh, in the preliminary study of 51 children, the children were asked to remember a sequence of numbers and report both forwards and backwards. Uh, what they found is that children with dental fluorosis, in other words, they had fluoride exposure enough to cause damage to the teeth, developing teeth, probably affected the brain, that those children performed less well in terms of recalling these numbers than those without the dental fluorosis damage to the teeth. Uh, Dr. Philippe Grandjean, he's uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health, Fluoride seems to fit in with lead, mercury, and other poisons that cause chemical brain drain. So um, it's a huge concern, and that's, so, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about the health effects from the drinking water, um, I think you have to look at everything, but fluoride is a big one, but all of these other halogenated chemicals, they're, they're all toxic from one degree to another and there's none of it should be in the water supply. Um, so why was fluoride top secret? Uranium hexafluoride. In other words, to make the U-235 isotope, which was the bomb grade uranium, to separate it from U-238, which was stable, and that was the most common isotope, but you couldn't use it to make atomic bombs. They needed to get the small amounts of U-235 separated. They converted it to uranium hexafluoride. So the fluoride component was top secret in the Manhattan Project. They were working with chemical companies like DuPont and others to make enough of the fluoride compounds that they could use in the chemical reactions to make the uranium hexafluoride and create the bomb grade uranium. The Manhattan Project even the name was top secret for many, many years. So the fluoride chemistry was ultra top secret. And this didn't come out until the 1990s when um, there was a woman who wrote a book called The Plutonium Files, 1999, I believe, 
won a Pulitzer Prize. And then there's other investigative journalists who've been documenting this. So what happened was, uh, let me go back. Um, okay. So the problem is it wasn't just in the bomb project that the workers were dying of the fluoride exposures. They were being, uh, having bone problems, uh, all kinds of disabilities. But in the areas where the uh, DuPont and other companies were manufacturing their fluoride chemicals, the farmers re reporting deaths and injuries to their animals, horses, cows, everything. Uh, farmers were reporting injuries to their, their fruits, um, their fruit trees and vegetable crops. So anyway, there was a huge problem, not just for the U.S. government and the Manhattan Project, but for, uh, um, for DuPont, for the Alcoa that was using uh, fluoride chemicals as a catalyst. It's uh, hydrofluoric acid, HF, is a super catalyst used in the aluminum industry, the steel industry. So the government people said, well, we don't want it out there that we're using these fluoride chemicals in making the atomic bomb. And so, you know, they said, we, we need to find a way to tell people it's really safe. Let's put it in the water supply. So it really is one of the biggest chemical deceptions that came out of World War II uh, and it's still really not out there. And I think this is part of the reason why the government's been so, you know, there's no law that says you have to put it in the water supply. But has Dr. Hersey and other scientists at EPA, they tried to fire some of these people uh, for even raising the issue uh, that they thought this was so toxic it shouldn't be in there. Um, so that's why this goes back to, you know, the Manhattan Project. Anyway, so conclusions, risk of children's IQ loss at current uh, fluoride uh, levels in the U.S. is very high, okay? Uh, fluoride exposures must be reduced. Uh, I don't drink any tap water at any restaurants. I haven't for decades, okay? Um, addition of fluoride in drinking water and the use of fluoride tablets must cease. Uh, it, it doesn't really work. That's what the science is revealing. It's too toxic for anybody, not just children. Um, the economic consequences of IQ loss uh, for U.S. children are substantial. We think it's in the bill tens of billions of dollars. So um, first, do no harm. Add no fluoride or toxins to the water. Um, and so that's why I think that this is a big problem, not just in terms of water, but, you know, you know if you go out to eat anywhere, uh, they bring you a glass of tap water and ice. Won't drink it, okay? I take my own water everywhere, okay? Um, use filtered water. I don't want the fluoride in my body. Um, I'm already almost 73 years of age. I'm very concerned about carcinogens because I've lost four older siblings to cancer beginning in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And so I knew the family members would ask me, well, what's wrong with brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so? Why'd, why'd they get cancer? I said, the chemicals are everywhere. I said, it's not just one thing. It's a smorgasbord of chemicals. So uh, I work with a lot of these. I know they're in the water, they're in the foods, they're everywhere. And so we have to do what we can to reduce our toxic exposure because then you will live longer, you'll be healthier. Your children, your grandchildren will be uh, healthier. Um, so that's my message here, that you need to organize, um, get elected officials concerned that the level of toxic chemicals in the water is too great and it needs to be greatly reduced. Uh, they can do it, it costs money. Uh, we need to change the standards with the EPA um, and that's another thing. But, you know, anything's possible because it really begins with the public. Uh, making a lot of noise about these kinds of issues. And so, anyway, I'm happy to participate. Uh, oops, anyway, I wasn't going to show those, but thank you very much, okay? I, I know we have some other things to show, but I'll take like one question. RO works pretty good. Um, it may not be quite 100%. Uh, it's close to it. The fluoride is a very small material. 
and it's more difficult to filter out than fluorine, but uh, than chlorine. But yeah, I use this two, uh, a, a dual filter system that works pretty good. Uh, fluoride, there's not a lot of it, so whatever you can do to reduce it, it makes a big difference. Uh, it's, it's an ingestion issue. You won't get much in a bath or a shower. Uh, there's just not that much to go through the skin. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't drink any bath water, but I, I have bath filters too, okay? Infrared sauce? Um, yeah, you can sweat a lot of toxins out, for sure. You know, that, that certainly is, is, a, is a good strategy. I think anything you can do to get rid of toxins, sweating, the skin does have about seven million pores, so you can get rid of a lot of things through the skin. It's the quickest, fastest way to detoxify. And Dr. Carmen's going to be out in the lobby to answer any other questions and talk to you all. Um, we're going to move on, um, and I'm going to just mention real quickly about uh, Fluoride Action Network. Uh, we're not going to show the little clip that we had because we're going long. And so um, Dr. Conant and Michael Conant, his son, are suing the EPA along with um, five other nonprofit organizations and the e for fluoride. Um, they're using um, a different standard. They're using TSCA to, it's a Toxic Substance um, Control Act, and the judge is moving it forward. Usually these agencies, they will say that the, the person that's suing them doesn't have standing, and then they dismiss the case. But the judge twice has ruled in uh, our side to move the case forward. So that's really good. So, August, August 2019, the judge has set an eight-day trial, which is really, really good. And they had wanted to raise um, $250,000. They thought that would be enough. They're very economical. They do things really good. It sounds like a small amount of money. They've raised $300,000. So, this is good, too. So, we know they're going to move that forward. So that's Paul Conant, Dr. Paul Conant, and he would have Skyped in, but, it, you know, we are going long, and I want to get two other real important people up here. My uh, dentist, you know, they always say about the fluoride that the dentists, you know, the ADA and all these dentists are, are for fluoridation and for fluoride. Well, my doctor, Dr. Daniel Strader, uh, Strader um, he has designer smiles, um, and um, it's my, and anyway, he's a holistic dentist, and he's here, and he's going to come talk to you about um, his practice and why, what he feels about fluoride. And um, he's a third-generation dentist, and he's in Highland Park. And by the way, Highland Park does not fluoridate their water, and they never have. So Dallas needs to stop fluoridating their water. And in the North Texas Municipal Water District, they're having so much problems with the chemicals in the water. Why add more chemicals? It's crazy. Save the money. It's done at the end of the process anyways. So no equipment would have to change. Just stop adding the fluoride. So if Daniel Strader would come forward, welcome him here, and uh, he can give us some more information about what's going on. And so... Well, speaking from the dentist viewpoint, uh, as far as fluoridated water, it's like um, being told that the earth is flat or that the sun circles uh, the earth. It's just what we've been told. Just like we were told mercury and fillings were perfectly safe, the mercury stays in the metal and it never comes out. Just this last year, the city of Dallas has ruled that all dentists must have a mercury trap to keep the mercury from going into the water supply and making our fish poisonous. Uh, about 50% of the mercury contamination in our water supply comes from dental offices. So that's a definite step in the right direction. I have spoken before the Dallas City Board about um, 
discontinuing the addition of fluoride and spoke about how I'm right at the border of um, University Park and Dallas and that uh, the patients that come from the park cities don't have more cavities than the Dallas uh, patients just because um, they don't use fluoride, fluoridated water. And of course, one of the biggest problems with fluoridated water is it's a drug that's put into the water supply that should be uh, prescription medication, like for instance, um, blood pressure medicine, and just say, you know, a lot of people have high blood pressure, so let's just put high blood pressure medicine in the water supply. Well, how do you control the dosage? Some people drink a lot of water. Some people don't drink that much water. Uh, some people have uh, Berkey filters to filter out the fluoride. But essentially, in the dental office, uh, dentists like to talk their patients into getting a fluoride treatment after a cleaning because they get to charge another $25. Um, but as far as the fluoridated water, I think the main thing there is, I was reading an article about fluoridation versus democracy. And when a referendum is used to choose whether to fluoridate or not fluoridate, as they did in the park cities, uh, the people tend to vote against fluoridation. So uh, most of the larger cities just don't allow the people to vote. They just um, feel like they know what's better for us than we know for ourselves. The main thing then with fluoridation, since it is an uncontrolled drug situation, is to convince the um, city elders that uh, it is detrimental for all the very good reasons that the doctors just showed. and. Um, if enough people raise enough concern, then uh, we can finally get that changed around. I don't think the dental association or the general dentist are that uh, stuck in the mud, as you said, in the concept of fluoridation, um, giving up that additional revenue of $25 per fluoride treatment, maybe they're not going to like that too much. But as far as the city water supply, that doesn't really affect the dentists directly that much. And if uh, we could get enough dentists like myself who do not believe in fluoridation and have seen some of the side effects, uh, the first one that I became aware of was breast cancer and how the thyroid and the iodine and the fluoride competing with iodine and the thyroid and how that affects breast cancer. It became a pretty good concern of mine. And then of course, just like the mercury and fillings, we start to follow this, this trail and we find out as a First, do no harm, premium, no no cree, that a lot of the things that we're doing are really causing more harm than good. So I will leave you with that, just that um, our public outcry, if we could just get a referendum, then uh, I think the majority of the people are gonna vote against fluoride. Thank you. Dr. Strato will talk to anyone else too, and it's Dallas Designer Smiles. I didn't say that right before, and it's right over on Douglas, right in Preston, Northwest Highway area. They have great people that work there. Okay, so we have another person that's gonna come up and talk, Liz James. Um, she came to the Frisco event where uh, Aaron Brockovich was, and she got the microphone, and she is a pharmacist in Anna, Texas, and she had noticed that there's an uptick in certain um, medications being prescribed at, during the burn. We call it the burn, the, 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 the time when they turn off the ammonia and the, it's just the chlorine going through. So she's gonna come up and just tell us her observations and maybe how we can look into some sort of correlation. 
So would you please welcome Liz James. <laughs> Hi there. So um, holistic care is something that is uh, not really that common for a pharmacist, I don't think. Um, I have a lot of people that look at me a little funny, um, but I am probably one of the most holistic-minded pharmacists you'll meet. Um, and I spend a lot of my time trying to get people off of medication um, instead of getting them on it. Um, it's actually become my, my um, personal um, goal. So what I found, and a little background about me, um, I, I work for a chain right now. I've worked for them for about five years, and the first year that I worked for them, I did a lot of floating. And floating means that you go to different stores. And... Um, I worked in about 14 different towns in a year. That's, that gives me a pretty broad scope of what's going on. And I was in those stores very regularly. When I was in Anna, um, and I live in Anna, but when I was in Anna, I started noticing an extraordinarily high amount of ondansetron and Finnergan that was being dispensed. And I was like, my gosh, what is going on? Well, I ended up working in Anna full time. And so I really saw the trends. And I have to say, honestly, there were, there were upticks, but Anna in general has a higher percentage of Ondansetron and Finnergan prescriptions across the board. I mean, it's, there are times when it's like there is, um, a virus or something, um, even though there's not, because then I'll start asking the school teachers and saying that what's going on at the school, you know, and kind of get an idea. But um, I, I don't. I live in Anna, but I live on the outskirts of Anna, so I don't have Anna water. I do have North Texas Municipal Water District water. Uh, we are serviced by a co-op uh, on our farm. And I might add, too, we, we um, have an organic garden and organic blackberries. We have several hundred um, blackberry plants. We have to, we have to water them um, in a drip system on the ground because if the water touches the berries, the berries turn white. Yep. So, um, and that doesn't happen with rainwater, it's just, it's just the, t the water. Um, but the Anna water is foul. It is really foul. Um, I cannot say the, the co-op water that we have is a much better quality water, but it obviously still has its problems. But <clears throat> anyway, I don't, I, you can't even drink the Anna water it's because the flavor is so bad and it's, um, we have an Anna, um, I'm sure on, you guys all have in your towns or, or areas of Facebook groups where you know, we have all about Anna and different, different groups like that. And there has been threads of discussion that has gone on and on and on and on about people's hair falling out, their hair changing color, their skin issues. The same as with, um, I think the... PA's name was Lauren that spoke. Yeah, um, you know, st I started, I've started watching that too, and I'm sure that there's a correlation. What, what my recommendation is for you guys is you have the opportunity to go to your pharmacies, and it, this could be a coordinated effort, especially if you make friends with a pharmacist. And if you if you once you make friends with a pharmacist because because we're super super busy and it's not it's not that that they don't want to help it's that they're being driven by insurance companies and their companies they work for um you know it's the mighty dollar but if you will just say if you know when they when the burn is and i would say maybe maybe even two weeks after that, get your dates, 
and you're not violating HIPAA, which is the, the um, privacy laws, but if you go to your pharmacist and you say, we're trying, to, we're, we're trying to solve a problem with our water, is there any way you could run a report on, on all strengths of Ondansetron and all strengths of Finergan, and these are anti-nausea medication, um, during this time? They, you don't, all they have to do is give you a number. You don't, you don't have to get the report because depending on the company, the, somebody's name might show up on there and you can't have that. But if they just give you a number and then compare it to another date pre-burn and see what's going on, and you may, you may start to see some trends there that would be helpful as a huge unit. But, um, I mean, it's very concerning to me, um, just as a, a nat somebody who's interested in being well naturally and listening to these, the doctors, um, you know, it's, it also, fluoride is another issue that has bothered me for a very long time. I mean, it um, turns your pineal gland to stone, too. I didn't hear them talk about that, but that's a concern as well. So, um, you know, nasty stuff. Anyway, that's, that's it. I was just, I am here to be helpful and um, to commiserate with you guys and, and maybe we can work together. Okay. And that's wonderful that they'll come out and speak like this because for years everybody's afraid to talk, you know, for having backlash. But they believe in it enough and they're going to tell us. Now, it's interesting because Dr. Strader was talking about referendum and voting. John Abernathy, um, he, he, he's going to tell his story why he got even thinking about thinking of solutions. So this is John Abernathy and he's going to talk about home rule, home run. Thank you. I'm John from Plano. Um, can we start the slideshow so it's the slideshow motion? So Confucius say that a person who cooks carrots and peas in the same pot is unsanitary. A more modern version of that silly joke. I am a dad. That's a dad joke. Uh, it seems like it's not reaching. There we go. So a more modern version is paying a premium for organic carrots and peas. They cost a lot more, right? And cooking them in chlorine, ammonia, fluoride, and chloroform is my new definition of insanity. Okay? Some people complain when they hear about this kind of water issue. Some people worry. Some people shrug. Some people take action to protect their family, a whole house, water filter, whatever. A few people go to great expense and effort. So thank you. <laughs> Leaving their comfort zone to make a difference for strangers they will never meet. So I salute all of you who've spoken at city councils. You're my heroes. You probably aren't public speakers. I get paid to speak publicly from time to time. You probably didn't. You're organizing, you're engaged to make a difference, and so I say, I salute you, and I really mean that seriously. But the question I have is, what if the city councils listen respectfully? What if they did that, right? And do nothing? What if, what if that happens? What do we do then? And that's why I'm here. I'm here because I believe in very clean, pure, safe water for the rich and for the poor. Okay, the rich can install a whole house water filter. But what about the renters? What about the elderly? What about the poor? What can they do? So I believe in home rules equal home runs, and that's what I'm going to tell you about for a few minutes here. In home rule cities, we can initiate legislation. We can initiate legislation. I'm going to prove it to you. 
I've got to ask you a question. Do you feel empowered by that sentence? Do you feel empowered? This is empowering. All right, the, the, the doctor said that if, if the city elders would let us vote, forget that. They don't have to let us do anything. We can initiate legislation. So I live in Plano. If 5,559 qualified Plano voters, that's 20% is our city charter rule, 20% of the voters from the last election, municipal election, at the time I got that was May 2017, sign a petition with a proposed ordinance. Now, an ordinance is a law. It's a statute. It's something that, that, that has to be followed if it's enacted. If they sign a petition with a proposed ordinance, then, so I got an if, then, those go together, the city council must vote on it, pass it. And if they do not pass it, they must call a special election and let us vote on it. And so that's why I say that, that we don't have to wait on the elders. We can come up with a an ordinance that addresses the water that we're buying and we're paying for and we're drinking and we can decide about it. So I've come up with a proposal for your consideration. An ordinance that I would consider requires the city staff to first of all test the water frequently. All right, there was a lot of confusion. Plano actually wrote a public statement that said that that the North, I'm sorry, that the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality prevented labs from testing water during the chlorine burn. And I'm like, what? That was the most insane thing I'd ever read. And I read it and I read it and I read it. I finally cut and paste and sent it to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and said, is that in your rule? And I went and read their, the Texas Administrative Code and it wasn't in there. And they, they called me, they didn't write it back to me, but they said that it, that is not a rule that they can test. But anyway, test frequently. Secondly, the city staff would have to prepare a plan to filter the North Texas Municipal Water District water so that we meet the EPA health goals every day of the year. Now, those goals may not be where we need to be after listening to this presentation, but at least it's something that we can, that we can tag to and work from. Then, only add back the minimal amount of chlorine to meet EPA rules and regs because I do understand that that water's got to travel miles and miles and miles and a little bit of chlorine keeps it from, you know, we, I mean obviously we don't want to get into sickness and, and, and disease, but a little bit of chlorine and does not add back any fluoride, we can do that right there in our ordinance. We can, then we require them to determine the cost to implement this plan. So the first thing I'm asking them to do is engineering. What is it going to take to filter this water to get there? And then second, what's that going to cost? Once the plan and the cost estimates are complete, the city would then submit the plan to a vote so we all get to decide if safer water is worth the cost. Yeah. This is what it does. It puts experts on the water, the city staff, into the process to figure out how to achieve our goal. I don't know how to do this. I'm not an engineer and I don't know anything about water. Sometimes I wonder about them. It puts experts on cost into the process to come up with the capital and the operating cost because ultimately this is about cost. If it's going to cost $10 a gallon, then we're not going to be able to do it, right? So we've got to know what the cost is. Next. It allows the residents to, to the chance to decide if the costs are worth the benefit. Simple, reasonable, specific, cost effective, and enforceable. It's the kind of thing that I think that it, we can write an ordinance around that, we can get some signatures, and then we can force a vote, and we can find out what we want to do. What standard is acceptable? At a minimum, never exceeding the EPA maximum contaminant level goal standards with no averaging allowed. Now the thing that's interesting to me is that there are two different things in the EPA regulations. There's one that's, a, that's an enforceable goal, you get in trouble if you, if you cross it, and the other is a non-enforceable goal, and I've quoted from them right here. The maximum contaminant level goal is a level of contaminant in drinking water below which there is no known or expected risk to health. Now I understand that that's subject to challenge. However, these goals allow for a margin of safety and are non-enforceable public health goals. So I'm just taking that as a, as a simple way to explain to my neighbors, let's at least get there, okay? And then we can let the litigation continue with the EPA to fix those goals. So that's kind of a, how you link it together in my view. So this is what it looks like 
Uh, I've got it out there at my table and you can look it up real easily. What I've done is I've just pulled the two things that they tested in Plano, the, uh, the, the haleocytic acids and, uh, and I'm not gonna try to say the other one. And then what I did was I, I blew up the footnotes to these regulations and you can see here, they talk about the MCLG in the first sentence and they can talk about them being non-enforceable public health goals. They take cost into consideration uh, as compared to the uh, enforceable standards. And then down at the bottom across here, I, uh, I, I, in footnote number nine, there's no collective MCLG, no goal for this contaminant group, but there are individual goals. And Plano blew those goals terribly for those individual components. And so I'm like saying, hey, this is just, you know, I, it's not acceptable to me. Now, I'm not in a position to say this water is not safe, okay? I'm simply in a position to say that my shower wasn't safe, my tap water, I'm sorry, it wasn't acceptable. I can't say it's not safe. It wasn't acceptable. The shower water wasn't acceptable, and blowing those goals is not acceptable. Can we do the next one? All right, so here's the enforceable standard in that column, and then go ahead one more time. And over there on the far right is the public health goal. And so there's an entire publication, several pages of this, which I have, and we, sh we can use that far right column as our goal. So the Plano details, this is how you have to enact uh, an ordinance. 20% of the voters in most recent municipal election, I looked up Garland today because I was going to be here, I think it's 10% Garland. So different, different levels and different cities that are home rule cities. All the signature of registered voters have to be gathered within a 45 day period. So th this, that's the hardest part of the whole thing. The, the time you get the first signature till the time you reach your goal of however many registered voters you're gonna get to, you gotta do it in 45 days in Plano. And all the signatures must be witnessed by the person submitting the petition. And so that means we can break up into, into groups and go around the city and, and get this done at different places. If you are interested in working on this, leave your name, city, email address, and cell number at the table in the foyer. I've got to sign up at the first chair uh, on the right as you're uh, uh, heading out. Uh, it makes sense to me to coordinate this effort across all 13 member cities in the, uh, in the whole water district. And the reason I say that is if we have one ordinance or one similar ordinance across all 13 cities, that in itself might force the water district to take note. And to, and to begin to think a little bit, okay? If we have a, a whole bunch of hodgepodge of things, if one city only dismisses fluoride and whatever, I don't know that we'll get the same effect. It's a steep climb. The level of effort will be significant. It will take a team in each, each city. I can't do this, I got a full-time job. If we get there, I will call that a home run. So that's why it's home rules equal home runs. Are you ready? is my question to you. Thanks. Okay, so the doors close, and we're supposed to be out of here at 9.30, but I'm glad we ended a little bit after nine so that you have some time to talk to these people here and, and ask your questions, because sometimes from the group it's, it gets hard to answer the questions. So thank you all for coming. Um, this is gonna be on a YouTube, and um, I, well, we gotta do something, guys. This has to, this, this is us doing it. It's not gonna happen unless we, we do it. So thank you for coming. Thank you.